This podcast was recorded at 1 p.m. on 11 July Jakarta time. Things may have changed by the time you hear this. Enjoy the show. Welcome to Reformasi Dispatch. I'm Jeff Hutton, Regional Correspondent of the Straits Times of Singapore. And I'm Kevin O'Rourke from the Reformasi Weekly Service on Indonesian Politics and Policymaking. This week, we have Ahok making friends over at Pertamina. Indonesia downgrades its economic forecast. And after the break, we speak with Roberto Herrera Lim of business risk advisory firm Tenio. But first, Indonesia is bracing for a sharp acceleration in the already rapidly spreading Delta variant of the coronavirus. We're recording this on Sunday, and at this point, we're coming up on 40,000 new cases a day. But as infections take root in the crowded suburbs of Jakarta, the concern is the capital faces what would amount to be a surge upon surge. I've heard talk, uh, Kevin, of, of daily cases upwards of 100,000 or so. Is that at all in the realm of possibility? Um, <laughs> uh, yes, can't be ruled out. Be bad, but not that bad. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm thinking about is that uh, there was uh, one press report only that I saw about a random uh, antigen rapid testing en masse in Tangerang City, which is one of the key industrial suburbs of Jakarta and a place where infections have been bad. And they sampled 2,500 people roughly and found out that uh, 500 of them have active infections right now. This happened just late last week and a few days ago um, over a three-day period. So that means that 20% of the population of Tangerang City um, is actively infected. And now that may be a little bit skewed because they're probably randomly sampling people who are kind of out and about and, and are there for people at at risk more than people who are being cautious and staying at home. But even if you reduce the percentage by a little bit um, or by a few points, you know, it's still really high, um, which in turn, then you know, it's a horrible thing and it helps explain why there's such a crisis right now. But in turn, the question is uh, how much higher can it go? And unfortunately, that this all kind of uh, hinges on the uh, transmission patterns of the Delta variant and how many people are asymptomatic and therefore have immunity and uh, how many are untouched? Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, I get, and, and then what level of her, herd immunity finally slows down the Delta variant? And these are all unknowns. Um, but assuming that the Kota Tangerang, the Tangerang City Survey is accurate, 20% of the population is actively infected right now in the greater Jakarta area. Yeah, maybe it could still double. Right, right. Uh, before we get uh, too stuck into um, the Delta variant and what what may stop it, what's uh, what are the latest numbers you're seeing right now? Uh, I, I was I was looking at uh, yeah at, uh, the the various government websites and it was looking like we're pushing forty thousand uh, with um, seven day moving average at just over thirty. Yes, correct, exactly. Yeah, so um, the past uh, let's see uh, five days now. The uh, number of case detections nationwide has exceeded 30,000. Uh, on two of those days, it was above 38,000. But if you look on a seven-day moving average, uh, which is much better, it's still rising by approximately uh, 2,000 cases a day. And um, lately, 33,450 cases uh, on a seven-day moving average as of 10 July. Uh, unfortunately, though, the positivity rate na nationally is 26% which is exceedingly high. And so therefore, the case total would be higher if there were simply more testing. And um, yeah, so it's there's un uncertainty about the r real scope. Uh, but nonetheless, the official data, uh, which um, is a pretty good indicator anyway, uh, is showing a continued upward trend nationally. Now, What's interesting, too, is that specifically for Jakarta province, where there's uh, many more people vaccinated, the, the full vaccination rate in Jakarta is about 22 percent. Um, there, the uh, seven day moving average is also increasing and it's uh, up above 11,000 as of 10 July of new case uh, detections. So that's really pretty uh, a pretty horrific situation. Um, you well, it's, it's, the scale of, yeah. I mean, it's it's really horrific because if you get 
seriously ill, there's increasingly fewer places that can take you. There's, there's discussion of even turning the grounds of parliament into a, a, a field hospital. And we're seeing this, we're, we're seeing a massive a, you know, mass casualty field hospitals being set up in, in cities around the region. Um, thoughts turn to India and access to supplies like oxygen. So, yeah. Going on there. Yeah, exactly. With 10 or 11,000 new cases every day in Jakarta, it's just dwarfing the uh, capacity of the healthcare system because until now, throughout the course of the pandemic, the government was using the athletes' dormitory the complex, which uh, houses about 8,000 um, uh, patients as an emergency hospital. And until now, one of the indicators of the pandemic was how much occupancy uh, is in the athletes' dormitory. But, um, you know, Right now, every single day, Jakarta is producing more new cases than than can be accommodated in the athletes' dormitory. And so the government has been preparing new facilities, other low-income housing blocks that can be used for isolation wards, for example. Um, and there's a big one in, in the Mangarai area called Paso Rumput with accommodation for another 8,000 people. But they need to be finding these things on, on you know, faster than one per day at this rate. And that's just clearly impossible because... Um, they don't exist. And even if they did exist, the ones that do exist don't have furniture in them. Uh, plus, they don't have staff to uh, go around and check on these thousands of uh, isolating patients to make sure they're okay and not getting worse. And they have all their needs. Um, so basically, sick people are on their own right now, really. The ones really in need of oxygen have, I think, largely been able to get it, uh, I guess, and in a lot of cases. But that's only a matter of time before it runs out. The, the, the numbers are sl simply outstripping the capacity of industry to produce oxygen and the, the numbers of machines or concentrators that fill canisters. And the oxygen canisters themselves are not produced domestically, so the government is scrambling to import more. And so the mortality rate will increase. It's already above 1,000 a day on a seven-day moving average uh, or... Um, Close to that anyway. Um, right. and that's going to only worsen in the days ahead, I think. But Indonesia is scrambling to import canisters of oxygen, or, or does it have the capacity to make its own? Well, um, so part of the problem is that there's uh, two different types of oxygen. Hospitals use liquid oxygen in large holding tanks that uh, then gets converted into gas and pumped through uh, lines installed in the building to individual beds. And um, there's, there is more capacity to produce that, but there's, there's only, the hospitals are full, so that doesn't help the overflow, which is the issue now, which are uh, sick patients being cared for in emergency tents at pretty much every hospital in Jakarta and most other cities in Java. And there, uh, because there's no installed lines, of course, in these tents, they have to use these portable canisters that carry either one cubic meter or six cubic meters of oxygen gas. And for those, they, um, they need concentrators to uh, take the ambient air and filter out the nitrogen and fill the canisters. So the government is importing 10,000 concentrators from Singapore, but they also need to uh, import the, the canisters themselves. And so there's instructions for uh, canisters used for other gases to be converted into oxygen canisters, and um, yeah, it's a it's a real scramble. In every city, there's um, a special task force set up to try to find ways to overcome the oxygen constraints. It's what's been interesting to note throughout this entire crisis is how quickly we come up against the the weak links in any sort of response, and in in this case. Now it's actually getting the machines to put the, the oxygen into the canisters. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's the rate limiting factor. It's the rate limiting factor. Yeah. And yeah, it seems like there should have been some anticipation about this. Um, you know, if there had just been some thinking through about what would happen in a worst case scenario, um, presumably it, the fact would have arose that there's no domestic canister manufacturers and therefore something needs to be done. And that, that could have been a realization that happened back when India was having its spike. Um, well, the, the big question that everyone has is, is about the vaccines. And we, we both know people who have been sick. 
uh, despite being fully vaccinated with uh, the CoronaVac, which is from Sinovac, um, some people are actually getting quite sick. And there have been there, there's been media reports of uh, medical workers uh, um, dying um, despite being vaccinated too. So the question I put to you, <laughs> mm. uh, on behalf of listeners everywhere, does the CoronaVac work? Oh, that's an easy question. Uh, the answer is we don't know. That I no no points for that. <laughs> Edges no. All <laughs> okay, all right. Let me uh, on, let try again. Let me try again. Okay, I would say that um, it does. It's, it's too early to tell, so we need to be careful in condemning CoronaVac or having unfounded uh, skepticism about it because. Uh, there's a lot of reports that are citing the numbers of healthcare worker deaths over the past two months as an indication that obviously CoronaVac doesn't work against Delta. Otherwise, these people would not be dying. But hold on a minute. Uh, first of all, no vaccine is perfect, uh, the, regardless of the disease. Um, uh, they all, all vaccines work at some level of uh, efficacy, whether it's 70%, 80%, 90%. There's a test data, interestingly, from Turkey just came out yesterday, I think, or a couple of days ago that showed 83% efficacy of CoronaVac from Sinovac in Turkey, although that was probably against the alpha variant, I think. But that's a good phase three trial result that, that's encouraging uh, regarding CoronaVac, uh, the first really comprehensive, clearly reported study available. But uh, the thing about uh, CoronaVac is that... Uh, uh, the number of healthcare workers uh, fully vaccinated is about uh, a little over 1.4 million uh, nationwide. Plus, there's another, if you can believe it, 143,000 healthcare workers in Indonesia who have yet to complete their vaccination, uh, which is pretty astounding. But the, the data about this is good. This is one area where the government does keep good data. So um, those people are running a gigantic risk, if you can imagine, being a, a healthcare worker in Indonesia and not being fully vaccinated right now. Uh, and so um, we don't know of the deaths over the past two months since Delta emerged, how many of those deaths are from vaccinated or unvaccinated people. And it's quite possible that quite a lot of them may be from among this group of 143,000 uh, not yet fully vaccinated healthcare workers, uh, especially given the fact that it seems apparent that CoronaVac's first jab doesn't really do much. And it's the second jab that really provides the protection anyway. But even just if we assume that uh, all these deaths are from fully vaccinated healthcare workers. Uh, still, the number of deaths we have affirmed uh, to date is uh, 153. And this is a huge tragedy, of course. I mean, these are heroic healthcare workers who have been struggling under the utmost adversities. Um, uh, so, you know, this is a very sad thing to be talking about, but um, yeah, they, it is important to look at these as an indicator of what other healthcare workers are going to be facing and thinking about and also what this tells us about how good this vaccine is uh, for the whole country going forward. Um, and what it shows is nothing really, because 153 out of 1.4 million is practically is not much. I mean, for those 153, of course, it is uh, everything, but it is literally uh, one one hundredth of one percent of the total uh, vaccinated uh, people. Now, of course, the number of deaths is going to increase sharply. I think it's going to be in increasing by a dozen or a few dozen even a day um, in this coming week as uh, healthcare workers infected since Delta arose in early June um, suffer the onset of symptoms and sicknesses and then fatalities will feed through uh, subsequently, so sort of, which will, is happening right now. So the number is going to increase, but that, that number of healthcare worker deaths can still increase quite a lot and, and still not yet impugn the uh, efficacy of CoronaVac. So, um, yeah, like I said, we don't know. It, it may be that CoronaVac does not work against Delta. Uh, we just can't say for sure yet. But what I think is pretty clear is that so far, the data does not show that CoronaVac does not work against Delta. And um, I suspect, my suspicion is that if indeed CoronaVac did not work against Delta, we'd be seeing quite a lot more healthcare worker deaths and frontline worker deaths right now uh, than is actually the case. So I get you a very short answer and a very long answer. That, that's basically it, though, isn't it? It's the, what, what's the alternative? And if the alternative is no vaccination, 
um, the Coronavac is doing is is mm-hmm. is, is, is a better option than oh, not yeah. being vaccinated at all. It would seem. I have to. We have to um, hasten to remind people that neither of us are medical professionals. Or <laughs> yeah. <pathologists. laughs> Um, yeah, but, in my case, not even close, actually. Not even, not even close. I know, I, I know you went to Harvard, Kevin. Well, but yeah, so- yeah, and I did take an undergraduate course on, um, I forget what they called it, uh, physiology. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. And uh, I, think I didn't really do very well on that course. Yeah. So. A first aid badge from <laughs> 2012. So I did get that but, one too. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, I, I might trump you. Um, but still, it, <laughs> And also what people have to keep in mind is that although these people got sick, um, maybe they didn't get as sick as you might have were it not for the vaccine. Um, Mm -hmm. So people are getting sick, but they are recovering. Um, So I guess if it, if all I had, I I was just speaking for myself, if all I had access to was the Coronavac, I would get it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. At this point, should we mention our sound engineer, Stephen Handoko, and uh, it's, disclose it's, his health status? That would be up to our sound engineer, Stephen Handoko. <laughs> this. Yeah. Well, he can always cut this out since he is our sound engineer. But uh, he, in case he uh, wants us to leave it in, uh, he was designated positive with uh, COVID last week, uh, but is fully vaccinated with CoronaVac and is recovering now. Stephen uh, is he's recovering. It's fine. The segue after that is uh, the, well, the politics and, and the economics. And we had a, we had an announcement from Finance Minister Sri Modiani that um, the GDP of the country will grow by as little as three point seven percent. That's down from uh, I believe four point four percent was the previous. Forecast: uh, Indonesia is not alone. Thailand last month uh, downgraded its GDP forecast, and there may well be other f- other downgrades to come. Judging on what's happening in Malaysia, more on that later. Want to walk us through that? Uh, to my mind, three point even three point seven percent feels optimistic. Yeah, that may very well be the case. Actually, just considering the extent of the um, the slowdown um, hitting. Uh, uh, Jakarta in particular, and really all of Java, which is, um, uh, I think almost uh, 80% of GDP is on the island of Java. And most of Java is under some form of uh, mobility restriction or lockdown right now. Things in Jakarta really are quiet. And it's, uh, it's like the, um, usual annual Labaran exodus when you can drive around the city at high speed, every, anywhere you want to go. It's kind of, kind of like that right now in Jakarta. Um, uh, and then ambulance sounds, of course, are incessant, but uh, otherwise there's there's not much going on. And so the uh, data for the third quarter is going to be very low and um, possibly sinking back into recession again, I guess. Uh, or considering that the third quarter in 2020 was also low, maybe um, it'll just be fairly flat. The one sort of saving grace maybe with regard to the full year GDP figure that will come out for 2021 is that Indonesia was recording a big growth figure for the second quarter of 2021. And, and that was uh, for two reasons. One, the economy really was picking up a little bit uh, in the, the, the past three months there. But also the second quarter of 2020 was uh, very low. And so there was just a, a big uh, improvement year on year, which uh, contributed uh We'll be contributing a, a large growth figure, I think, for that second quarter uh, on the range of maybe uh, 6 or 7% year on year for the second quarter. And so that will contribute to a potentially positive uh, full year GDP growth figure at the end of 2021. But basically, though, this, this is really a big setback right now, for sure. Um, you know, it just takes the momentum out of the recovery. It really compounds the hardships and strains the government's uh, resources as well. Uh, speaking of resources, you know, it's it's no secret that Indonesia can come up with a budget and all sorts of great spending plans, but sometimes they don't get out the door. And I think that there was some commentary that the government spending plans, its aid packages will not be cut despite the prospect of a, of a slower growth. But 
you know, it's it's something to watch for, right? I mean, the, the, the economy needs all the help it can get. One of the sticking points is that just the the machinery of a government in Indonesia can get gummed up pretty pretty easily. Are you seeing any evidence that money's getting spent and money's getting out the door? Or are we going to be talking in November about how only 18% of the budget has been spent? Um, actually, um, yeah, I think the central government is actually doing a pretty decent job now of making sure that uh, salaries are going out, especially to healthcare workers. I believe that's the case. Uh, it's hard to tell for sure. But uh, projects are still getting emphasis, and it's noteworthy that despite the uh, strict emergency mobility restrictions in place now, the construction sector is one of the sectors that is still 100% open. And um, that's very evident driving around. There's still gangs of construction workers uh, working hard, clumping together with no masks as well. <laughs> but um, the, there is a, a risk, though, that uh, some of the really big construction projects, especially, for example, in the uh, oil and gas or um, mining sectors, are going to face delays because uh, some of those projects have uh, thousands of workers that are... Uh, uh, transported to and from remote sites every few weeks. And uh, keeping that type of an operation free from COVID is going to be virtually impossible. And it's going to result in slowdowns and delays and pretty significant projects uh, throughout the economy. So, yeah, um, you know, the, a saving grace right now is that commodity prices are very high. So the coal miners are making enormous amounts of money right now. Palm oil producers, small holders, with agricultural uh, crops, and um, in the oil and gas sector itself, for that matter. And so that feeds through. And that, that, that's actually a powerful dynamic in Indonesia. It's something that actually reaches small holders in remote areas. And so uh, that's a major saving grace right now. So you're, you're a little bit glass half full right now? You're yeah. Sounding glass half full. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Oh, it's good. All right. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is Kevin O'Rourke here. Uh, I want to tell you about the Reformasi Weekly Service on Indonesian politics and policymaking. If you haven't uh, checked it out, go ahead and sign up for a free trial. There's a button to do so on reformasi.info, my website. You may very well like it. If you like the podcast, uh, you're probably going to like the report. Uh, the only difference is that you'll have to actually actively read it instead of just listening to it. Uh, we've got all sorts of subscribers, uh, major embassies, donors, banks, uh, resource companies, uh, NGOs, journalists, universities, and uh, individuals who are like uh, retirees or students, uh, yeah, uh, entrepreneurs. So uh, reach out, get in touch, and uh, there are discounts that are available depending on your category. And it's a, it's a unique resource, I can say that. Uh, there are some copycat uh, products out there now, but uh, I would recommend that you go with the original. All right, for the remainder of our, of our little chat, Kevin, I wanted to talk about our friend Ahok. Of course, we shouldn't be talking, we shouldn't be calling him AHOK anymore. He's got a, an acronym now, isn't it? Uh, BTP? BTP, right? Basuki yeah. Jahaja Manama. Yeah, nobody uses that acronym. Nobody uses that, though. He's still AHOK. He's yeah. trying to rebrand, but um, yeah. for our purposes, let's call him AHOK anyway. He is the president commissioner of Pertamina, and he has come up with, a, he, he is a hit upon a little bit of shenanigans, I suppose, is that word again, with credit cards. And I wonder if you can explain this to me. They have credit card limits in total for use by their executives, not just at Pertamina, but at their ancillary um, throughout the group, that totals up to 420 billion rupia. Uh, <laughs> was, yeah. uh, where... Where can I get a credit card like that? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's exactly what one of my uh, subscribers to Reformasi Weekly immediately replied when I sent my report on Friday. He said, how can I sign up for a Pertamina credit card uh, with a credit <laughs> limit of uh, $30 million? That's pretty good. 
Uh, but um, that's actually for the. He's trying know, to crack down on on some um, some perks. What, what would the, what would these perks represent? What would they what would they be doing? Well, um, yeah, they. Um, this is uh, something that uh, uh, it's hard to tell whether these are used for uh, business purposes by companies because Pertamina's payment processes are so convoluted and cumbersome that sometimes if they really need to get something done, they can't pay for it properly uh, through ordinary channels. And so they just put it on a credit card. And, I mean, that could be, you know, buying trucks uh, or, or whatever, but um, I think probably, or certainly in a lot of cases anyway, directors of Pertamina's holding company, especially, but also of its various subsidiaries, because Pertamina now is very much a, a group of companies, having done quite a lot of acquisitions over the past five years. Um, these directors are using these credit cards for personal uh, reasons and personal needs and consumption and so on. And so Ahok uh, flagged this last month and uh, demanded accounts in, in his uh, role as president commissioner and has yet to receive any uh, information or details or reports or accountability about how these credit cards are being put to use. So that in, a, in and of itself, I think, is the significant thing that there's a disjunct between uh, the president commissioner of the company on one hand and all the other executives on the other, apparently, who are refusing to comply. Just, um, just in um, parenthesis there, Kevin, what is the difference between a president commissioner and a president director? So he's not actually the head of the company, though, is he? No, this is a <clears throat> continental European system, a legacy of uh, the Dutch era. Uh, so the uh, board of directors are the ones who manage the company on a day-to-day -day basis uh, with the president director heading that board. And they're the ones that have the most power. And in this case, Pertamina's president director is Nikki Widiati. Uh, and then above that is the board of commissioners. Every company has uh, both. And um, in this case, Pranama is the president commissioner, the head of the board of commissioners. And their function is to perform uh, oversight, monitoring, and assert prudential controls and, and represent the shareholders as well. So there's uh, uh, commissioners representing the shareholders, but there's also independent commissioners who are meant to have um, you know, auditing background or some expertise in, in, in oversight. But of course, in practice, and especially with state enterprises, lots of times those commissioners are there just to draw down pretty fat salaries without doing much work. So the appointment by <clears throat> Joko Widodo of the former Jakarta governor, uh, Ahok, as president commissioner of the most important state enterprise, Pertamina, was um, uh, quite a breakthrough, um, uh, quite a risky gamble um, because it creates for an inherently volatile situation where you have Indonesia's foremost uh, governance shark on one hand in, in the key oversight role for what is arguably the country's uh, most notoriously opaque uh, company. Uh, and right now it's finally coming to a head where uh, Ahok is, he's been laying low and doing little for a long time, but now finally last month he said, well, can I see the director's credit card reports? And the answer has been a resounding no. <laughs> right. So yeah, this uh, could be untenable now. Um, untenable, meaning that you think he may have overplayed his hand? Right. Um, so the key uh, arbiter is Eric Tohir, the Minister of State Enterprises, and he finally made a comment about this on uh, 9 July or 8 July and was uh, decidedly uh, ambivalent. And he's trying to straddle the two sides. And he, he said that uh, commissioners uh, perform oversight. That's a valid function that they have to do. It's their duty. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm sure that the credit card use was perfectly professional. Mm -hmm. So um, the problem is that there's so many people in the Widodo administration, uh, you know, generals from the Suharto era or uh, you know, military figures uh, with that kind of mindset that, um, yeah, there could be quite a bit of uh, negative sentiment against uh, Pranama uh, Ahok uh, for this. And uh, these people could persuade the president to finally oust him. So just to get a sense, um, so Pertamina is notoriously late in playing, paying its suppliers and getting money to its, um, to its affiliates. So they bridge that gap with these cards. That's the explanation for it. 
you know, we, we weren't able to get reimbursed from the company. We had to buy these trucks. We just put it on the card. They could be using it for personal use, but there could be also some uh, shenanigans going on with it was corporate cash flows so with hoarding money and just opaque operations that um, could could lead that, that could engender rent seeking. I suppose we need to point out that, that when Joko we took over, I seem to remember back in 2015. Um, 2014, rather, he quickly got rid of Pertamina's trading arm because mm -hmm. it's, it was just basically <laughs> it was a it was a rest awesome. opportunity. <laughs> but, uh -huh. do, do you want to remind the the listener about about that? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, Ahok uh, said last week that uh, these uh, uh, opaque, slow processes for Pertamina to pay its suppliers are deliberate in a lot of cases because. Uh, suppliers become desperate for the money they're owed from Pertamina. And there's a role there, said Ahok, for third-party brokers to move in and elicit the payments from Pertamina in exchange for a cut of the proceeds. And that, that gets shared around uh, in you know, as kickbacks to people involved, allegedly. Um, so uh, thus gives rise to the need for credit cards for directors to use when they really do need to get something done because there's an unwillingness to rectify the procurement procedures uh, because the slow procurement is something that helps foster the, the rent seeking and, and the kickbacks that uh, benefit the insiders. Uh, and then the, the supply chain issues go back uh, decades. And um, the issue had always been that Pertamina was using a, an offshore or subsidiary Petrol, first in Hong Kong, then in Singapore, to uh, buy its uh, gasoline uh, and crude oil that it needs to import uh, in ever-growing quantities. And that was all done with uh, no transparency whatsoever. And so lots of times there were um, you know, markups and then kickbacks uh, uh, spread around. And there was one supplier in particular, Reza Mohammed Chalid, who is uh, still affiliated with the National Democrat Party of Surya Palo, NASDEM and still has influence. The uh, information minister was the uh, right-hand man of uh, Reza Chali uh, for many years. Uh, so um, there have been different efforts to rectify that over the years, but uh, it's still unclear what actually is happening when Portamina imports uh, fuel. They supposedly were importing from national oil companies uh, as of 2016. That was a new policy, but um, so in some cases, those national oil companies may have been sourcing from Chalid's uh, suppliers anyway, uh, sort of just uh, going through an extra uh, stage to uh, obscure the origins of the materials. Um, but uh, uh, the good thing, though, is that uh, Pertamina has reduced its use of premium. So premium is the very low quality fuel, and that's the one that the price has been manipulated a lot. Uh, and that is sort of disappearing from filling stations around the country very, very quietly. So uh, Pertamina is instead replacing it with Pertalite, which is a commercially priced gasoline, which is higher quality, still not great quality, but um, better. And so, so I think the situation is improving, um, but it's, it's not rectified. And Ahok, uh, his, his alliance, his, his protector, his Eric Torhir, uh, that might be becoming shaky. He's, he, he, so Ahok might be on the way out? No, it's too early to say that. I mean, I shouldn't be so pessimistic about that. Uh, it's um, yeah, it's going to depend on uh, Ahok, really, and on how hard he wants to push for changes in Pertamina's management. Um, yeah, he's been pretty low profile so far, and he may uh, resume that. Um, yeah, it, uh, things haven't really reached ahead yet, but... Uh, mm. They are escalating. All right, we'll leave it there. Coming up, Roberto Herrera Lim of Tenio.
Hi, Bob. Hey, Kevin. It's really good to be with you. And hi, Jeff. Hey, Bob. Thanks so much for this. Thanks for joining us. Um, first, I want to congratulate you, Bob, because you uh, really hit the big time now, Reformacy Dispatch. So uh, this is a big moment for you. Yeah. Yeah, I look forward to sharing everything I know with everyone who's listening. So hopefully it leads to something good and useful. Yeah, well, I mean, I think you've appeared on uh, CNBC and CNN and BBC. So it's a natural progression from there to up to uh, Reformacy Dispatch now. Yes, the golden standard. I, although I haven't been invited to Fox News ever, so I, I still have some ways to go. <laughs> Ouch. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> well, before we run out of time, Bob, I want to first touch base with you about uh, the situation in Myanmar, because that's something that we've covered twice in past podcasts. And I kind of uh, worry that uh, the world will gradually forget about what's happening in Myanmar. So I think it's uh, the least we can do to kind of check in when we have the opportunity. And I know that's something you cover. So what is happening in Myanmar lately? And, and what's your prognosis there? And just in a, in a nutshell, and I also want to know about the envoy uh, that uh, ASEAN was supposed to have sent there. Is there any progress at all happening uh, with that one? Yeah, Kevin. And, you know, it, it's frustrating for anyone who's watched Myanmar for so long since 15, 20 years ago. We were pleasantly surprised when the generals a decade ago decided to, in all earnestness, pursue their roadmap to democracy and even though there were a lot of skeptics, they stuck with it, right? Uh, it wasn't perfect. And the military always having a role by a, the constitution was always something that you had to deal with or struggle with in terms of understanding where the country was going. So, so the coup was really disappointing in that regard. And I think that disappointment is more pronounced than anything I've seen in a fair amount of time around Myanmar, definitely on the ground. There's, there's not only a lot of disappointment about what's happened, there's a lot of disappointment about ASEAN, that ASEAN has not taken a stronger stance on the issue. Now, you are familiar with ASEAN, so you know that ASEAN basically doesn't take much of a strong stand on anything. But I think there is still a, a large amount of disappointment on the ground in Myanmar. Now, externally, obviously, there's also a lot of disappointment. The, the challenge, I think, among countries is coordinating it, given that there are so many points of view on what to do with Myanmar. Do sanctions work? Do sanctions just punish people? Does engagement work? You know, or what kind of engagement works? And there's no clear answer. So for Western European countries, it's sanction and engage only on principles that we can agree with. For some Southeast Asian countries, it's don't sanction and engage because engagement is the only way to at least get something out of them. So not having the kind of coherent, cohesive international response gives the generals time to figure out what to do. And, and that leads me to the last point, which is, you know, after, uh, th there is still a large amount of resentment within Myanmar against the generals. I don't think the, the you know, the, the bulk of the population wants to accept them, but they, they, you know, there are realities and the realities people have to go to work. People don't want to go to jail. They know the military is capable of a of a harsh crackdown. So, you know, the, their ability to come forward with some kind of like Arab Spring moment or people power moment was maybe there a couple of months ago, but it is disappearing unless there is a, a trigger coming forward. And that's what we're watching for. Hmm. How, how toxic is Myanmar for your clients? Uh, we saw that uh, Kirin a beer the um, the Japanese beer, beer company had a big presence there. They pulled out. Are you finding your clients are really eager to sort of rid themselves of any sort of Myanmar links or are they, you know, just um, waiting for just, uh, you know, battening down the hatches? I, I think the bigger the Western firm, the more concerned it is that it gets entangled in something it doesn't understand. And therefore, for them, the strategy is to disengage and disengagement can mean a lot of things. It can mean leaving the country. It can mean not paying uh, until things are clear. Although that, you know, not paying can get you on the wrong side of the generals. So for them, that's an additional issue. So, so you know, for Western countries, especially though, you know, with all the ESG practices that we're now seeing, all the sensitivities towards governance, it's a, it's really a minefield in terms of the different issues that you have to deal with. So, as you said, Kirin has left uh, some companies, like the franchisees, the local franchisees of Western brands have started to leave Myanmar. Now, that might be 
due to economic conditions, but that also might be a sense of you know we can't we can't do this anymore. So, so you know it's it's really a bad situation for them because right now the military is tainted, and if you are either seen as giving money to the military or providing it benefits or doing business with the military-owned companies, you could find your shareholders, you could find your local media in your home country saying, why are you doing this? And, you know, given the size of Myanmar, some markets, for some of them, they might say it's not, it's simply just not worth it having to deal with all these reputational issues. Some countries, especially the Southeast Asian countries, some companies are sticking it out. You know, the Thais, the Singaporeans, Vietnamese who are there, you know, and even the Filipinos, they're, they're probably just trying to lay low. So uh, to a certain extent, the reaction is informed by the governance standards under which the foreign direct investor is operating in. And that, that Jakarta summit that happened earlier this year, was that ultimately a, a waste of time or even a setback? Because it seems like it hasn't produced uh, much at all. Yeah, no, it, it didn't produce much at all, right? People were, were very surprised when, th- when they came out with their five points and then everything, almost everything was not followed. You know, I, I'm pretty sure the strategy of the gels was simply show up, smile, don't commit overtly, go home, don't implement. So, and that's ASEAN, right? That, given the consensus building nature in ASEAN, it's very hard to slap a member for doing that. So, you know, yeah, Indonesia was well-intentioned in doing it. And I think Malaysia and Singapore also pushed Philippines, Cambodia, Vietnam, less so. And that is the dynamic that the generals understand functions in ASEAN. Let me ask you this, Bob. Um, is there any risk uh, to uh, ASEAN as an institution right now? Is ASEAN itself going to suffer a taint and other entities around the world are going to pull back from engaging with ASEAN as an institution because of how it's uh, mishandled Myanmar? No, ASEAN wins by default in that regard, right? Because no one else you can deal with that as an infrastructure regionally, right? Like if you wanted to do something on the health front in ASEAN, whether it is with the pandemic or whether it is, you know, long-term planning on customs harmonization, you know, the boring stuff that you don't want to deal with every bureaucracy every single day with you, you ASEAN is an option. So ASEAN's bureaucratic infrastructure will allow it to survive. So the longer term question is, uh, does the fact that on security matters, whether you're talking regional territorial issues or whether you're talking domestic problems, right? Whether you're talking the Rohingya issue two years ago where ASEAN did basically nothing. You know, it, it's sort of ASEAN is accepted by default that it's this organization that doesn't do much, but, you know, when you need it, it might do something. So, and there's no substitute for it right now within ASEAN. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah, that's, uh, thanks for that. I wasn't expecting anything uplifting on that particular question, so that's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, we better turn to COVID now because uh, that really is the uh, preeminent crisis at hand. And um, so what I do from looking at Indonesia is I look at uh, what Malaysia has been going through and uh, draw comparisons from that. Is that a, a valid way to understand what uh, Indonesia is facing right now? And, and if so, what does Malaysia's uh, experience uh, tell us? I, I think the rest of the region, all the bits and parts of COVID will be found in all the bits and parts of Southeast Asia. And so, so what are the different things we're seeing? The first is obviously, and this is the clearest, right? The Delta variant has done something. If you take a look at the charts of every large Southeast Asian country, with the exception of the Philippines, and I will argue that that is due to some luck, maybe, or more luck than, you know, it, it was better for them to be lucky than good. But if you take a look, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, Cambodia, even Vietnam, they have all seen numbers higher this year or the last six months than anything they saw at the peak of the pandemic. Now, at, at some point, epidemiologists, people who do graphs, who do the who do the modeling and simulation will tell us why this happened now. But the general sense in the region is one, Delta broke through and it spread through countries. And that although vaccinations have been happening, they are not yet at the level that would provide a sufficient barrier to Delta because except for Singapore, and Singapore will always be an exception when you discuss Southeast Asia. Except for Singapore, we most countries are what, like 2, 5, 10% in terms of fully vaccinated individuals. And many times these individuals are spread throughout the country. So it's not like you vaccinated everyone in Jakarta and Jakarta is like this 
fortress of vaccinated people where you might get a couple people sick, but because everyone else vaccinated, transmission declined. So, uh, yeah, so I think the lesson that we've learned is when Delta came in, spread, even though vaccinations were going, but not at the rate it or level of population that you would need to stop Delta. And that's what everyone in the region is dealing with right now. I think contact tracing, which used to be, you know, the gold standard back when the pandemic started was contact trace, isolate, etc. I don't think that's right now working. You know, Vietnam is still trying it. Singapore tries it. But the virus is out in the wild in almost every country that last year thought it had added control, which was basically Cambodia, uh, Malaysia, and Thailand. Last year, you know, you were seeing all these rallies in Thailand, right? Every, almost every day, there was no major spike. But right now, no rallies, but even Thailand can't bring it under control. So what changed? People in the news are wondering how long the current lockdown will need to last. What does uh, Malaysia's experience or, yeah, I cite Malaysia just because it seems to me that they're the ones who have suffered the worst spike this year uh, in ASEAN. But of course, there's India as well. So what are your thoughts on what it takes to to bring down a Delta spike and and how much longer that's going to require in Indonesia? Yeah, the, the, the experience with Malaysia, and this is the problem, right? They they had the spike several weeks ago. Let's make it a couple of months ago. And then they tightened and then it went down. And then they relaxed and then it went up again. So it was almost like the moment you relax, this variant hits you, okay? So my concern about Indonesia is right now, we, I don't think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kevin, I don't think we're seeing the start of the downward trend, right? And given the high positivity rates or the high positive detection rates, and I don't know how public transport is right now because, you know, some of the things we've learned is that offices, that there are uh, situations that appear to allow it to spread. And in Malaysia, the initial one was a, a few months ago was elections. In the case of Thailand, it was nightlife in Bangkok. In the case of Indonesia, as you said, it, it probably was Idul Fitri holidays, right? The, the travel around Idul Fitri. So where, what kind of constraint or what kind of restriction stops the Delta variant short of a full-blown lockdown? I don't, that's a challenge. We don't know right now. We knew that last year, right? If you lock down with, you know, and with a relatively huge hammer, things would stop because it's, it's simple science, right? If you don't meet with anyone, obviously the, the virus starts going to travel. But if there's a fair amount of, because you, you can't shut down the economy, right? Uh, I think many governments right now do not want to shut down economy. So they, they try to allow as much as they can. So if you allow public transportation, how much of that works against what you're doing? If you allow people indoor dining, how much of it, how much of that works against what you're trying to achieve? And I think with Delta, the challenge is we're still grasping for answers. No country has been able to bring Delta in Southeast Asia back down. You know, you could have, uh, if, if you're talking the UK, if you're talking other countries, it was through immunization. You basically had to get to those high levels of immunization. And that's my worry with Southeast Asia, that we will aim for lower numbers and we will be able to achieve lower numbers because of all these restrictions. But right now, Indonesia is doing, what, 35, 40,000 a day in new cases? You know, is 10,000 the realistic goal, not 5,000? So how, how, how effective then are, you know, if the answer basically is vaccine because, I mean, that seems to be what, what's working. Is the CoronaVac from Sinovac the one to do it? Well, you know, the challenge with CoronaVac is it had different numbers, right? The Turks, somebody said 80%, somebody said 50%. And there's a relatively straightforward formula. But again, this is a formula in, in, in shall we say, in the textbooks, right? That it depends on the efficacy and the uh, reproduction rate of the virus. Now, at the, at the, high, the lower the efficacy, the higher the number you have to vaccinate. Now, they were saying that with a, with a 90% vaccine, you know, with a... 90% lab, lab efficacy, you could, you'd, you'd need 60% to 70% to get to herd. So what, you know, what, is CoronaVac 80 or is it 50? Then that number goes up even more. And that's actually my worry for Southeast Asia that everyone's put a number on and we really won't know. Now, the good thing that is encouraging to me, and this is where I think the region could shift. The first is, even though you are getting these reports of healthcare workers getting sick. If you run the percentages, it's still manageable. It's still low. 
actually. It's actually within the what you might consider the the range of the vaccine as promised initially. But you know, it, it doesn't make for good headlines if suddenly 800 people vaccinated get sick. When if it's 800 out of 30 million, that's actually quite quite decent. And then you find 50 die out of those 800. It's still sad, but it's you know it's within the realm of of the numbers of that vaccine. So you know, m- my gut sense is coronavac going to work. It will, but the challenge is getting people adequately informed that. This is, you know, just like anything, you know, the cliche is this is a process. Trust the process. If we work this way, we will get there now. Yeah. So the challenge is to, to sustain the credibility of the vaccination program. Yeah. You've said that Indonesia is a canary in the coal mine. Yeah, yeah. Because Indonesia has more people vaccinated on an absolute basis than any other country in Southeast Asia, I think. It has many of the conditions that I see in countries like Myanmar and Philippines, which is, you know, and which are the, and to a certain extent, Vietnam, but Vietnam's just like Singapore. You sometimes treat it as an outlier. But, you know, crowded conditions, the question of how vaccine hesitancy kicks in, because that's one of the things I am watching Indonesia for. This is not going to be a straight line. At some point, vaccine hesitancy becomes a factor in how, how you know, in the willingness of people to take it. You, you know, in the US, what's the number, right? 60%. And they're now hitting slowing vaccine uptakes, right? Uh, yeah, and that's already the U.S. So in Indonesia, I don't know what the survey numbers are. Each country has different numbers. So at some point, Indonesia will hit vaccine hesitancy. So right now, it's probably the low-hanging fruit. But when we when Indonesia hits vaccine hesitancy, that for me will be a very interesting point. Because if we don't conquer vaccine hesitancy, uh, in some countries, it's going to be a real problem. Philippines, you know, only one-third of people have said they are willing to take the, the, the vaccine. One-third have said we're hesitant. One-third have said no. We're not going to take it. So if even you split in half the people who are hesitant, you're look, I'm looking at the Philippines as 50% unwilling to be vaccinated, which is kind of scary and worrisome, right? Because as the longer you stay unvaccinated, the higher the probability that you're going to create another variant, theta, upsilon, or whatever, Greek. But we kind of knew that, right? I mean, we, we knew that we've run up against vaccine hesitancy before. And in the Philippines, there was a very, there's a very good reason why there was um, hesitancy wasn't there a, a French pharmaceutical company that was trying to immunize um, high school students or children? Um, I forget what the disease was, and it uh, uh, dengue. Dengue, right? I mean, that's that, that's really awful. But wouldn't wouldn't just a, a concerted public health message that was you know reinforced by all the leadership, everyone singing from the same page, that, that would do the trick, right? That that's what will give behavioral economists jobs for the next couple of years, right? How do you convince, yeah, how do you, you know, it's, it's like say, it's like financial inclusion, right? People don't, you know, how do you convince people to save? How do you convince them to save for, because everyone wants to do, you know, one, wants to go to Starbucks every single day and spend, you know, uh, something that they could save up and rationally, you know, save up for something bigger in the future. It's going to be the same thing with the vaccine. And, and this is like, so these are some of the nuances and I don't know how it is in Indonesia, but like in the Philippines, we have free Facebook in the Philippines. You can... Uh, it's the main route by which information is transmitted through many of the lower income households, right? So, yeah, so information is fragmented in the Philippines. So not everyone has paid internet access. The elites have it, the poor don't. Uh, newspaper readership is down. And as you know, Duterte shut down one of the major TV networks a few months ago. So there's this fragmented information system. The one that actually people rely on is Facebook. Because there's a free version. I don't know if you have it in Indonesia where you don't get the the images, but you get the whatever's passed along and you can do Facebook calls. Facebook, Facebook is playing a very important role in this, in the Philippines. So I don't know how in Indonesia they spread information. But again, yeah, so you'll have the formal channels, government, you know, posturing and everyone, celebrities endorsing. And then somebody gets and says, hey, I just got my cousin got sick after getting Sinovac. How much does that weigh against the official voice, right? Because no, no one's going to say, hey, but I took a look at the efficacy studies and this is within the margin of error of P, etc." That's not going to happen. That's not going to happen in the provinces. No, I've, I totally agree. But a, a campaign that says, ask your doctor, forget social media, forget what your neighbors say, ask your doctor. That, that's one good way. That's one good way. I agree. That's one good way. So I think it's up to governments to find a way to tweak their messaging 
and find out how, how do you get best to different people in different places with different types of access to information. So yeah, you can tell them, talk to your doctor. And then, you know, one of the things Garmix can do is make the local health officer, make the local nurses available and say, just talk to us, ask us. We know that. The challenge is, I'm not even sure some of the you know local health practitioners have all the information they need. So it's really, you, you have to have a system for doing it and you have to, you know, throw resources at that system. Yeah, and, and structures too, or uh, or policies, because some of the concerns are valid. There is a uh, poll data showing that a substantial number of those in Indonesia who are hesitant calculate that if they suffer COVID, the state is going to pay for their health care. But if they suffer side effects from the vaccination, they have to pay that themselves. That's what they think. And so addressing that is something that, that that's, that's something that can be addressed. Um, so. And and I and I gotta ask Kevin, what's the narrative in Indonesia about how much would it cost me if I got sick with COVID, and how much would it cost out of pocket? Because in the Philippines, the narrative is if you get sick with COVID, and you had to go to a hospital, you're paying a minimum of a couple thousand dollars just to get oh, through the whole no. thing. And Here it's free. Here it's free. No, that's the thing, right? So there are different narratives in different countries. So in the Philippines, people don't want to get caught with COVID because then you get mired into this whole system of you know yeah there are parts of it free that will be paid by the philippine by the by the national insurer but if you want the kind of treatment that lines you up for what's essentially needed in your opinion you have to pay it out of pocket and then there's that whole thing so yeah it it, it a, lo- a lot of it is system dependent i would say well uh, just speaking personally uh my Pembantu doesn't want to get the vaccine, even though our building is uh, uh, providing it for free for all the for all the employees. <laughs> and it's, she uh, she says she's scared. Yeah, we, we we get the same thing here. I think the farther away you move from the cities, the higher it is, and it's really a challenge because how do you get information to them and to the people they trust, right? Whether it is their local religious leader. It is their local village captain, as you said, the local healthcare person, or they're maybe like in the case of Philippines, you have lots of Filipinos living abroad. You know, they're they're relatively in the U.S. saying or in Middle East saying, "I got vaccinated. You should get vaccinated too." So you 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 have to do all of these things, and uh, yeah, some governments are simply not up to it. Jeff, uh, uh, Bob, I got a question for you. Uh, Indonesia and the Philippines have uh, one thing in common that uh, only Japan and a few other countries around the world have in common, which is that they theoretically at least have the ability to uh, cordon off uh, whole areas of their countries from one another precisely because they are archipelagos. But that doesn't seem to crop up as a policy alternative, um, certainly not in Indonesia anyway. Um, And I guess now it's a moot question because the virus is so widespread anyway, it wouldn't work at this stage. But is this something that anybody in the Philippines talks about, uh, separating physically one island from another in order to protect one and, and constrain the virus on the other? No, I, I think what happened in the Philippines, and you know, I, I, were, were there ever any constraints on interprovincial movement in Indonesia in a serious way, like uh, implemented? Well, what was interesting is that some some of the local heads of certain islands did precisely that. They said, "Okay, no more boats uh, allowed to arrive here," <laughs> which. Yeah, this was uh, at, the, at the start of the outbreak, and I thought it was pretty sensible and kind of you know, might have been a good strategy. But yeah, well, yeah, they, they do block roads sometimes, yeah. Uh, but the, typically, um, the Home Affairs Ministry comes in and says, no, you need to uh, maintain transportation links uh, everywhere uh, because there's just a real innate distrust of secessionism and, and separatism, and um, that doesn't want to be any admission that it's possible for one part of the country to be. Uh, distinctly separate from the rest. So, no, no. For the worked. Philippines, for the better part of the last fifteen months, it was extreme. It is was extremely difficult to travel to another province. Uh, you know, like if you wanted to go far, three five hours north, you'd have to get a PCR test. You would have to get a local certificate from your, you know, from where you were coming from. Uh, and so, for most people, traveling was a an economic. This incentive. Now, this, of course, didn't include cargo trucks, delivery trucks, something that you would consider essential, right? But if you you were in Manila and you wanted to visit your relative in, you know, an island and had to fly there, 
you had to comply with the testing requirements. You had to qualify with uh, quarantine requirements. They it, it was it was a pain to be honest, and I think that's one of the things that may have slowed it down. Now, what they are thinking, therefore, in the Philippines, recognizing that you know one is the Delta variant comes in from overseas. Uh, we don't have it in the wild as badly as I think other countries. And they think that, oh, in the future, it might not be Delta. Again, it might be some Greek letter variant, another one. So the transmission mechanism is the Filipino worker coming from the Middle East, from the U.S., from Europe, right? So what they are thinking is actually vaccinating Metro Manila faster than the rest of the country in the hope that if you can, or, or the major entry point cities, in the hope that if somebody comes in, you tell them, okay, quarantine in Metro Manila for a week or two weeks th- before you can go to your home province, that will be enough to slow down variants from spreading domestically. And since Metro Manila accounts for 40% of, of Philippine GDP, that at the same time, you, you, don't, you, you, know, you let the economy start to work. Now, the, the worry about that is then you'll have two kinds of economies in the Philippines where you have a relatively vaccinated population, economically important, definitely. But what happens to the people in the rural areas? Does it generate resentment that they are being vaccinated at a slower pace? Uh, that, that's a, that's a, that, that could be a big social issue. Yeah, that's analogous to Indonesia because the vaccination rates in Jakarta are three times as high as the ones in the countryside right now, or, or four. But um, yeah, in any event, yeah, handling this uh, crisis is going to require governments to really uh, spend a lot of energy. What? What's Kevin? Hey, Kevin, I got a question. What, what's the tar- What's the? What's your realistic expectation for forty percent, fifty percent vaccination? Well, that's yeah, it's very feasible in Indonesia because um, Indonesia benefits, unlike the U.S., for example, in having uh, massive ranks of apparatchiks who can go out and actually uh, reach people in communities and, and uh, administer vaccinations. And so it's, it's rolling out steadily, and it's uh, something that Indonesia can, can very much uh, do. It's just a matter of supplies, and those supplies are now coming in because the first shipment from uh, Moderna via COVAX from the U.S. arrived with 3.1 million doses just uh, on uh, July 11th, and um, uh, it's going to ramp up in the second half of the year. And so right now the uh, nationwide vaccination rate is over 8% of the target population of 180 million. Uh, That's about 6% of the national population. And um, yeah, I I can, I think I can, yeah, I haven't uh, figured out exactly what uh, percentages they can get to by year end, but it's going to increase substantially during the second half of the year. Okay. That's good to hear. So a rough guesstimate would probably be hopefully like, you know, just to the point where people feel comfortable would be like quarter two next year, right? Quarter one, end of quarter one next year. Yeah, I would think the end of quarter one next year would definitely be feasible because I think by that time there's going to be ample supplies of vaccines available. And uh, yeah, so. Yeah, so sorry for interrupting your segue. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, okay. Turning to energy. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of talk in Indonesia about uh, carbon neutrality for the state uh, power monopoly, PLN, and phasing Indonesia away from coal. So uh, I wanted to ask you what other countries in the region have uh, done in this area and um, therefore what the prospects are for for Indonesia's path to actually bring that about, because there's a lot of skepticism uh, here. On the other hand, though, I think uh, Vietnam has made some real strides. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Vietnam is increasing its, shall we say, the availability of renewables. Solar is very, very much on its agenda. And they are trying to get, it's, it's not exactly carbon free, but, you know, they're trying to get natural gas up as a share of their energy generation. In the Philippines, the Philippines has had no approvals for new coal-fired power plants. And in fact, the largest power generator in the Philippines, San Miguel Corporation, you know, they make beer and they make power, has said we are not going to build any more new coal-fired power plants uh, beyond what's on the, what's on the table. So you are you are seeing this across the region. I think it's a it's a recognition of a couple of things that just on the corporate side that ESG investments are rising, and you know there might there might be opportunities there to avail of financing, uh, which ultimately reduces your cost. That's the first thing, 
And I think just a second that as a whole for the region, similar to the rest of the world, concerns about the environment are becoming a much more popular issue. And you can't be on the wrong side of that if you're a policymaker or if you are a, a company now. It obviously depends on where you are, right? Uh, Cambodia would probably be on the lower side of that. Uh, and they have distinct politics related to all the power projects that are being built in them. But then you have on the other side, Singapore, Malaysia, where, again, the, there is a belief and an expectation that moving away from fossil fuels is the right thing to do maybe both economically and as a quality of life issue. Hey, can I get in there for a second? Um, I want to I want to pick your brains about Rocon. Chevron, uh, it, it reverts to, um, to Pertamina uh, next month, I think. Are you hearing anything about potential partners there? Chevron will be uh, upping stakes and leaving pretty soon. Uh, not from my side. So uh, Kevin might have insights, but no, I, I haven't heard anything substantial or significant in this regard, unless Kevin puts it out in his newsletter. Right, yeah, no, my understanding is that, um, you know, Rocon is a quintessential declining asset. It's a very old oil field, uh, which takes uh, a lot of energy to uh, sustain the production levels through uh, steam injection. And basically, international oil majors around the world uh, when they spend capital, they don't want to spend it on a declining field. They want to spend it on uh, something exciting that's going to boom. And uh, so therefore, for Pertamina to find a partner is going to be extremely difficult for that reason alone. Uh, plus the fact that Pertamina has reputational issues and uh, that uh, complicates its ability to partner with uh, the kind of uh, reputable companies that it needs to sustain that production because it's so technologically uh, complicated. Kevin, I got a question in that regard. You know, one of the things I tried to highlight is how policy is made in different countries. Like in the Philippines, we don't have a large state-owned enterprise in energy. So policy is basically a fight between the private sector players and the regulator. And obviously, there are always accusations of regulatory capture and the like. And then you have countries like Thailand and Indonesia, where you have huge state enterprises in the energy sector and therefore are seen as having influence, even disproportionate influence. What, what's going to decide the energy story in Indonesia for the next five, ten years? Is it going to be more of a, a, you know, sort of this kind of Thailand story, which is they try to coordinate because the, the state player is such a big one, which is also the case in Vietnam? Or is it more like the Philippines, where fight between Regulatory capture, the regulator, private sector interest, et cetera. And, you know, that, that could also be a big mess. Right. Well, yeah, it kind of de depends on defining energy, because if you expand it to include coal, then there is a big private sector element, very formidable private sector players who have massive overrepresentation in the Widodo cabinet. But for the oil and gas sector, it's uh, a worry because uh, Indonesia, I think, needs more gas production in order to supplant the uh, even more dirty coal use in power plants. But the gas production is not going to increase because the investment climate in the oil and gas sector is not good, in large part because everything nowadays goes to Pertamina. Uh, and Pertamina is not really performing very well at all. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, has a hard time getting the partners that are needed. So the oil and gas sector outlook is pretty grim right now. The, the current minister is trying to improve things. And there's also a good uh, deputy basically under him. But it's a real uphill battle and they're not really making much ground at the moment. So the, that's why there's skepticism about Indonesia really ever being able to wean itself uh, from coal. Yeah. When you say improve, what, what does he need to do, you think? Well, they need to basically improve the terms and conditions for foreign investors, uh, which uh, they are proposing. Um, but you know, the, there's still this tendency for Pertamina to swoop in and, and take expiring blocks or to uh, be partners in every project. And uh, that uh, affects sentiment. Didn't SBY kick out their board 15 years ago for trying to do that with, was that Natuna? The ExxonMobil field, right? There's been a lot of turmoil in the leadership, for sure, but <laughs> the uh, the beast uh, stays the same, more or less. And there's pricing issues uh, for, for gas as well, which are interesting. Basically, the government right now is trying to uh, make natural gas cheap for industries in order to boost industrial production and exports. 
but that has the uh, effect of depressing investor sentiment and exploring for gas. And so there's going to be a shortage of gas at this rate. Yeah, I, I remember one Philippine company trying to get into the energy sector in Indonesia, and then they ran into Pertamina. <laughs> yeah, uh, and you know, some parts of Pertamina, I think, are, are quite a bit better. And, and overall, they're not as bad as they used to be, but uh, they still have a long way to go. Uh, so there, there's a lot of hope, therefore, for uh, solar power, uh, because that should be relatively uh, uh, feasible and, and user-friendly, um, provided the regulations are in place. Uh, plus, uh, coal is uh, super expensive right now. It's at a decade-long high. So uh, I was wondering whether you, the, did these solar projects in Vietnam, were they terribly expensive for the government to underwrite or were they reasonably sensible commercially? I, I think they are reasonably sensible com commercially, right? So uh, Indonesia's benefited just from the, uh, sorry, Vietnam has benefited from the surge of interest in renewable. Uh, the fact that the government was willing to be very liberal with its terms and the decline in the cost of installing solar, right, which dropped substantially up to a couple of years ago. I think it's the, the decline has slowed down in terms of, of cost, uh, but it's it's worked for them. But again, the, the big challenge, I think, and at some point, solar, uh, you know, people are talking about batteries and the like, and I don't know, I'm, I'm not an expert on how feasible it is in many of the Southeast Asian countries, again, with the exception of Singapore, to have the proper infrastructure for you know, solar, uh, if you move away from coal, it's solar, it's gas, oh, yeah, to a certain extent, geothermal, to a certain extent, hydro, especially if you're around the Mekong area. But that's also another issue in terms of just the environmental cost of it. So, yeah, it's, it's going to be a lot of changes and may, maybe more significant than anything we've seen in the last two to three decades. So it's going to be an interesting time for, for watching how they shift or realign their energy policies. We need to get a couple questions in about Malaysia, don't we? Yeah, as, uh, I wanted to, uh, at the risk of harping about uh, Malaysia here today for some reason, um, I did notice that the government uh, is teetering there. And so this uh, naturally raises questions about whether the, the government in uh, Indonesia is going to be teetering because of its COVID handling. And of course, the answer is, but nonetheless, uh, I wondered if you could bring us up to date on, on what exactly is happening in Malaysia. Yeah, so, so Malaysia, to use a medical term, had pre-existing conditions, right? You know, after, after Anwar and Mahathir won the elections, they got into a fight or their factions got into a fight over when Anwar would succeed Mahathir. And that led to a showdown a couple of years ago, which caused part, Mahathir's party then Bersatu to move over to the uh, current ruling coalition. So... But the current ruling coalition is composed of parties that potentially compete with each other in the same electoral districts. You have three Malay-centric parties in, in the current uh, ruling coalition. There's UMNO, the, the old big dog. Then you have Bersatu, which was a breakaway from UMNO. And then you have uh, PAS, right? They're all Malay-centric uh, parties. And especially Bersatu and UMNO potentially overlap when you come to elections. So they didn't trust each other. And I think that is what is coming out right now. So UMNO, uh, you know, it, 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 it's never faced an existential threat. And now it is, it, it is phasing one because it has to ask the question, where do we go? And then there are all these issues about, you know, uh, can Anwar work with the breakaway coalition that is now threatening to leave the party? So you had, yeah. Sorry, why now then, Bob? Is it because of the COVID spike? It, it, it was always a narrow majority. It was always a, a ticklish situation for them because they, they, when, when, uh, when, when, when you had that flip-flop that, that resulted in Mahathir losing his PM ship, the, you know, the, the lead was five or seven people, three or five even, I'd say, jumping over, and then you'd have a new, different government. So it was very narrow, and so everyone was opportunistic. And uh, uh, the prime minister was never that popular and because of the situation you couldn't get the pulse on people's like oh is he doing well enough that you'd expect him to survive and therefore etc no he was he was again he was prime minister a lot through much of the covid crisis and malaysia has been ups and downs and now it's down so i think again that's the compounding fact factor the yeah the pre-existing condition of presiding over a fractured or fragmented uh party system and then, you know, things have gotten worse in the last three to six months. And obviously that doesn't work when you're 
presiding over a party where three or four people jumping over could turn the tables on you. So, uh, so is, is yeah. An- Anwar Ibrahim finally going to emerge as prime minister after waiting for it for 20 plus years? I've been waiting for it for 20 plus years, so I'm, I'm going to hold off making a prediction. <laughs> <laughs> no, th- th- this is Anwar's problem. If he, the only way he becomes prime minister is if the defectors from um, from uh, the current ruling coalition from PN jump over to him. Now, among those defectors would be Najib Razak, the guy they kicked out, and they said you're corrupt. Yeah. You do all these things. So for Anwar, it's a he's, he's the billion dollar whale. Yeah. So for yeah, Anwar, yeah it's, for Anwar, it's like you know, if in the Philippines, it's like Mrs. Aquino saying, "Hey, I'm going to accept." you know, a Marcos into my party. <laughs> yeah, it, it raises <laughs> fundamental questions about what, what what did you stand for, right? I don't know, what what would be the analogy in Indonesia? Tom, I, think, I think they'd include Tommy Saharto. Megawati, <laughs> Megawati and SBY. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that would be right. It, it, uh, what's, what's the name of SBY's son? I keep forgetting. Agus. Yeah, Agus. Yeah, so would Megawati and Agus ever work together? No. And be seen as fundamentally not contorting themselves if they were able to do so? No. No. Yeah, so, so that would be it, I would say. Uh, wow. But, like, how, how long can Malaysia muddle through like this? It's been, it's been like 18 months or something. There's probably going to be a downgrade in their GDP forecast. And Malaysian electorate has already indicated that they've had enough of, of, um, of self-dealing, uh, callous politicians um, you know, how long can the center hold? Uh, so here's the thing. You can't have elections while you have this current crisis. So my gut sense is it'll take, what, even assuming they get things right in dealing with the COVID, with the public health issue right now, it would take them at least three months to get people confident enough to say, hey, we're going to have elections, we're going to have rallies, etc. Because rallies were being blamed last year for one of the spikes. So the earliest you can have elections, in my thinking, is fourth quarter of this year, assuming everything works out with your current response. On the other hand, uh, that's one variable. And the second variable is, but I think Muyidin Yassin, the prime minister, is dead man walking politically, right? So it's simply a question of when the conditions that allow UMNO to pull the trigger and cause a government collapse manifest. And, you know, again, so they, so will they decide to say, OK, we're going to pull out right now. We're going to throw, every, you know, we're, we're, we're abandoning the boats. We know elections might be five months away, but we can live with that. Or they say that's too big of a that's too big of a gap. You know, something might happen. Uh, we might not have access to, to you know, pre-election spending, et cetera. That's too dangerous. So they decide to stay with the listing boat and just keep bailing water out. Uh, again, this is the first time this has happened, I think, since the new, the NEP, since the late 1960s, early 70s. Uh, and so everyone's, you know, putting in their best efforts at stabbing everyone else in the back uh, and just trying to get the most they can of the situation while the whole, while it hasn't collapsed. So, yeah, uh, you know. It, it's uh, it's up in the air. But if you ask me, it's only a question of when they hold elections and when public health conditions allow them to hold elections. And once you have that, to a certain extent, become predictable as a result of vaccinations or whatever health measures, then the clock starts ticking. Well, sounds like at least they're better off than U.S. politics. Well, yes, a little Bit. You know, well, U.S. politics, you got 2022 and then you got 2024, right? Uh, yeah, some scary periods. All right. Well, anything else, Jeff? Well, I'm, I'm just impressed that we, we spoke to you for 48 minutes, Roberto, and you didn't mention Duterte, Duterte more than twice. So <laughs> I think I won that bet. We had a bet, right, Kevin? Okay. <laughs> Are we going to keep... <laughs> Yeah, yeah the, 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 for, for another discussion, I think. Well, the, if, the, if the daughter becomes president, then she fulfills uh, Megawati's daughter's dream, right? Juan's dream, right? To be president. Uh, yeah. How bad is she? Actually, I think she will be better than the father. And you can, you can put that out. I think she will be better than the father. I think she has, you know, uh, Duterte built his reputation and his whole history on the legend 
or the myth, the, the narrative that I am a tough guy who does everything that it takes, regardless of you know where you might think I am on the ethical scale. I think she's not she's not built that way. Obviously, she's learned some things from her father, but I think she's not built like her father. So, uh, would she not be a finger puppet? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, you, you know, there are like people people throw out anecdotes. Uh, uh, like she canceled projects that were approved by her father, like mining projects. She has, I think, a bit more independence. Obviously, she will align politically and always and protect the family and protect all their interests, but. And, you know, always any decision will have the shadow of, you know, being a Duterte decision. But she's not, uh, I, I wouldn't go with a one-to-one correspondence. And is she popular? I mean, I thought that Duterte was never really popular to begin with. Right now, she is polling at 25 to, in a multi-candidate race, she is polling 25 to 27 percent. Most recent one, 25 percent, uh, but another poll her as 27 percent. So let's give her that. Uh, and then you have three or four candidates that are polling anywhere from 10 to 20 percent, 10 to 15 percent. So it's, you know, at some point it'll shake out because those other candidates, one of them is the son of Marcos. One of them is Manny Pacquiao. One of them is a senator and one of them is the mayor of Manila. So at some point it'll shake itself out and then we'll see who goes with whom. But she's definitely right now the front runner. And she's maybe just a couple of steps away from being seen as the real favorite. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Bob. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, happy, happy, happy to do it. Be prepared for us to call you back again in future. <laughs> yeah, I haven't left the Philippines in since the start of the pandemic. You know, and co- clients can't come over. I can't go to them. So you know, having a chat with other people is a luxury. And that's the pod. Thanks to Roberto Herrera Lim, Managing Director of Tenio. Our producer is Stephen Handoko. Editing by Aditya Akbar. Music by the Blue Dot Sessions. And for a free one-month trial of Kevin's invaluable Reformasi weekly newsletter, go to reformasi.info. And if you're listening to us through a podcast app, please subscribe and rate us. It helps. As always, you can reach us at hello at onthelevel.id. This podcast is a production of On the Level Media. I'm Jeff Hutton. Bye for now.